All right, here begins the Princess of the Universe campaign, a little uh, homemade campaign for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that's meant to begin at first level with first level characters, and it's set in the uh, setting of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, thus the name Princess of the Universe, and also because I'm a big Queen fan and a fan of the Highlander movie. Uh, sorry for everybody who thought this was going to be a Highlander <laughs> kind of campaign thing, but no, it's the Masters of the Universe. And uh, setting a campaign into a setting that's, uh, you know, that has a large fan base like He Man, uh, you tend to worry a little bit about canon, but uh, with He Man, the good thing is that the makers of it uh, really didn't care about canon all that much either, because if you go into the mini comics that came with the original toys, if you go to the comic books that were published separately, or you go to the cartoon shows and everything like that, almost every iteration of the Masters of the Universe uh, made their own versions of even the most well-recognized and beloved uh, characters, so we're free to use the source merely as a source of inspiration and make our own version, and that's what I'm doing here. For those of you who are not well aware, uh, the Masters of the universe setting is pretty much a mix of sword and sorcery fantasy and science fiction. Kind of like, imagine Star Wars, but with the fantasy and science fiction roles inverted to where in Star Wars it's like a space opera science fiction with a lot of fantasy elements like the Force and uh, swords and princesses and wizards and all that. But in the Masters of the Universe, it's the other way around where it's a very much like a Conan the Barbarian style, like sword and sorcery uh, setting with wizards and warlocks and uh, all sorts of monsters and hor horrible beings and ancient legends and on top of that there's a layer of science fiction with a lot of vehicles and uh, uh, technology and weapons being all very futuristic if someone's riding a horse it's most likely going to be a robot horse like uh, I have the image in my head of uh, imagine a knight errand who's wearing plate armor who lives in a castle and serves a king but he rides a robot horse and is also wielding a kind of a Winchester style laser rifle on his shoulder or something, you know, and of course the thing works on petrol and whatnot, you know, so that's sort of a mishmash of um, uh, two different flavors and it's also a very kind of um, stylized take on the idea, you don't have to go too deep into like the entire, like how, how does the setting, uh, you know, sustain itself with this kind of technology and this kind of magic, you know, don't take it too seriously, it's all about good fun. And because this setting is so filled with technology, this is the perfect opportunity for players who have been sitting on the fence about trying artificers. I would very much recommend the players giving artificers a try, even to the point of having multiple players try out different uh, uh, subclasses of artificers. Uh, that could make uh, things a lot of fun, and because there's a lot of tinkering having to do with um, uh, like uh, space age technology, technology and uh, all sorts of artifacts and magic items being all laced with the flavor of technology, that might be very fitting, so that's something you should really recommend to your players. The adventure is going to begin in a location known as Loredos, a very backwoods kind of planet that resembles uh, old western frontier towns, or mining towns rather, since in the near uh, past of this, uh, of this town, it used to be a very booming uh, center of uh, mining and commerce when a uh, gold rush of sorts uh, uh, hit the place when Feridium, a precious metal, was discovered in its mountains. However, the uh, evil empire known as the Evil Horde also discovered this Feridium source and they took over violently took over uh, the entire mining operation of the entire uh, planet and drained it completely and left it to rot. These days, uh, the only uh, populated areas like the town of Loredos is suffering greatly. It's, uh, it, it's constantly uh, uh, cooking under the blade blazing sun of the planet, the desert atmosphere is very unforgiving, the, uh, the, um, 
the economy of the of the place is completely run down. It's all you know, petrol and whiskey and the scum and villainy of the universe uh, traveling there to escape the reach of the law and the like. There are still some locals who have this romantic idea about their hometown thriving one day, but they do live under this constant oppression of a single harvest failing, dooming them all entirely. However, the players have found their way into this. Uh, location, it's something that needs to be iterated to them. That the game is going to start with you guys being in a run-down, old western-style town, where everybody is riding around in robot horses that run on petrol and the like, and uh, instead of revolvers, they have laser pistols and, and that sort of thing. But very much the sort of um, old western stuff. Just play the soundtrack of Red Dead Redemption or something, and everybody's gonna get the uh, atmosphere and <laughs> get into it. Uh, the town needs to be populated by the Game Master at this point, and uh, I would very much recommend the Game Master looking over the player's characters and looking over their uh, personal character histories, their personalities, their special abilities and whatnot, and conversing with them uh, where they're from, how they got into this town, and where they basically learned all their um, class abilities. In this setting, just about any any D and D uh, race, class, or any of those kinds of things uh, fit completely well because this is such a vast universe that just about any kind of character is very much plausible. I would actually recommend things like uh, War Forges and uh, maybe the Undead Lineage from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft or something because there's so many cyborgs and robots walking around as well. Uh, once the Dungeon Master has kind of figured out who the player characters are and what their abilities and preferences and likes and dislikes are and so forth, uh, he should basically populate this town of Loridos with ways of letting the players uh, try out their characters. If their characters have certain preferences and likes and uh, all these sorts of things, uh, there should be NPCs that they get to try those things on. If, they, if their character is very much into, like, uh, the nitty-gritty details about like uh, making weapons and stuff. There should definitely be some sort of a weaponsmith or a gunsmith in town so that the player can visit them and talk to them about guns and maybe talk about all sorts of uh, uh, ad uh, uh, additives and uh, additions and appendages and, and uh, knickknacks and flashy gizmos and stuff they can add to weapons and gear and armor and all that. And maybe if a player character is very much about like having a black and white idea about law and order, have some sort of a uh, commotion, come up with a, a, a kind of a member of the scum and villainy population and have the players take part in that or something of that sort. Uh, come up with different kinds of uh, very short uh, little interactions between NPCs and the location so that everybody gets a chance to basically have the limelight on them and have their character introduction happen through interacting with the town and with NPCs and uh, doing something active before the players are basically banding together and being tossed into an actual mission. This way the players will get the chance to really feel out their characters and also introduce them without them having to actually explain their characters to the other uh, um, players. One of the major NPCs in the town of Loridos that uh, is like pre-made <laughs> in this uh, little adventure is Sheriff Riolus. Uh, Sheriff Riolus is of course a uh, prior version of Rio Blast, a cyborg sheriff who works with He-Man later on in the stories and his personal uh, backstory is very much tied to the uh, to the town of Loridos and being the sheriff of that place and protecting it against the soldiers of the evil horde. But here, let's just have him be a good-hearted, uh, very, like, uh, lawful good kind of sheriff of the town uh, who who has the player's best interest and the local's best interest at heart. Uh, basically, if the players uh, wish to do stuff having to do with NPCs and the location, it's good. Uh, it's a good idea to tie Sheriff Riolus there somehow. Maybe he's just present. Maybe he asks a player's help for uh, detaining a dangerous you know, individual in a bar who's causing a ruckus or something, and uh, anything like that. Just uh, involve 
involve him somehow and make him very likable to the players. Just about every uh, person living in this town needs to be a pretty miserable and kind of distrusting human being. A very much like a, if you ask them how their day is going, they might ask like, uh, what do you mean with that? Because they're expecting to be mugged or assaulted or something like that at a drop of a hat. Uh, but Sheriff Riolus is different and he me needs to be someone that if the players later on get in touch with him, they will remember him fondly. And e it's either through Sheriff Riolus or through some sort of a um, notice board of some sort uh, that the players will eventually find a notice and that's a notice for a job. You can start the game off with the players already having a copy of that notice and they're just spending time like the meetup time for that notice's job is at noon and it's the, you know, it's uh, dawn basically when the game starts so they have the entire uh, early early part of the day to spend time in the town, spend time with the NPCs before they go on this gig. And that's when all this introductory stuff is going to happen. Once they go on that gig, there is going to be a recruiter. The recruiter is going to be standing around a spaceship, a space shuttle that's pretty much the size of, uh, uh, of basically a uh, mini bus or something like that. Something that can fit uh, maybe like 12 people inside it, and it's a very, like... Uh, a uh, measly kind of transport vehicle. Uh, he's going to be standing around it, and he's going to be a very rough customer. Someone who's expecting to hire, basically, scum and villainy, very, like, deplorable and very expendable people for a job. Now, this person is going to be named Cronus. And uh, Cronus is the name of Trapjaw. But this is, of course, Trapjaw before any of his cybernetic... Uh, uh, augmentations, uh, so he is basically still a blue-skinned uh, warrior working for, uh, let's say, a warlord who still remains unnamed, and if the players try to probe him on who his employers are, he will very much want to shut that down, because he is, one of his main priorities is to keep his own motives and the motives of his uh, employer and uh, of his ilk secret. It's it's a need-to-know basis only. But he is promising the players a lot of money. Let's say you can uh, you can say that the uh, price uh, or, or the bounty that he's offering is uh, basically um, uh, 20 gold pieces per player character. So how many uh, uh, players you have just add, you know, uh, 20 gold pieces per person and that's going to be their uh, price. Um, the job that he's basically recruiting people for is about uh, delving into the abandoned mines, uh, the feridium mines in the uh, mountain region, and uh, searching for any kind of old relics. He doesn't specify what culture they're from, what sort of powers they might emit. He's very much like, uh, yeah, this is all about like uh, archaeological stuff, and they have a lot of archaeological value. They they're going to be sold onward to people who will pay, pay big bucks for these archaeological finds and all that, but players can, of course, detect a layer of subterfuge from him, because, of course, he's really looking for artifacts that have magical properties. Uh, in the shuttle that he is standing by, there's also another person who's shrouded behind a, uh, a basically, a, the front uh, window of the um, of, of the uh, transport vehicle, and you can't see her yet, but uh, she's definitely there, so he's not operating completely alone. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, NPCs, kind of nameless NPCs. Just imagine a sort of uh, assortment of scum and villainy and the kind of dredges of society uh, applying for this job, but you can also add a lot of desperate locals, young people who have basically nowhere else to go, because a lot of the young people would definitely want to get off world if they got the chance and a part of the price for this gig is not only the money but also future employment opportunities and uh, that's when the players are going to be divided into groups uh, i mean the uh, recruits are going to be divided into groups and as it so happens the player characters are going to be one group uh, cronus is going to drop 
uh, all of these groups off into different locations uh, in the mountains, and the players are going to be dropped off at one uh, old abandoned mine entrance, and their job is going to be to delve into those uh, those caves and see if they find anything that's worth anything to Cronus. And if the players uh, want to probe and talk with Cronus, and most likely he's not going to be very... Um, enticed or very uh, uh, interested in getting to know the players at this point or reveal anything about himself. But if the players get good enough roles, uh, they will pretty much dis- pretty much discover that he's very much a dickhead. He is very much a very self-centered, egomaniacal kind of a kind of sociopath kind of a character who's very much into transhumanism and the kind of like uh, supremacy of uh, augmentations, like he. He's, he's really looking into like gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of ways to um, to improve himself. He has very much like this uh, uh, image of himself that he's like uh, perfected his body to a uh, the limits of uh, human capability, and he's looking forward to enhancing it further uh, when the opportunity arises. He's already like got a uh, wrist computer that's very much attached to his uh, uh, blood circulation and his uh, own DNA coding, and he's very much um, excited about that and might, if the players get good enough roles, might be excited to um, show it off and all that kind of stuff. So uh, he's very much into those kinds of things. But the next section of this uh, adventure is going to be the arrival into the uh, uh, abandoned mine and the actual mine cave cavities themselves, and that's going to be the actual first mission. <laughs> 